Public Works, the Cost of Our Aging Infrastructure is presented by Burns and McDonald and Heavy Constructors Association of Kansas City. The infrastructure election is over. What next for KC? This hour, we're at the Plaza branch of the Kansas City Public Library, talking with the people making the decisions and with you, from crumbling state highways with no money to fix them. Most of the uh, dollars that we're anticipating for the region for the next 20 plus years are really dedicated to maintaining what we already have. We barely have enough money to keep things in service that are out there now. To escalating water bills. But I don't have enough money for the water. If the water rates increase this month, they don't have the money to pay for it. To the future of transit in our metro. <laughs> Most of our transportation networks run north-south in the city, but the jobs are on east-west on the fringes. Is there more to connecting our citizens than expanding a streetcar a few miles south? If we was to get to places to like Lee Summit and Blue Springs using public transportation, that'd be great, but we don't have that here. This is Public Works, the cost of our aging infrastructure. Kansas City City Manager Troy Schulte is with us. You know, the Missouri Department of Transportation may have more than 5,000 employees and oversee the nation's fifth largest interstate highway system, but no one knows our roads better in this neck of the woods than Brian Kidwell, I kid you not. He's our <laughs> resident engineer on the panel with a quarter of a century at MoDOT under his belt. Also with us, the man who ran an entire county and then went on to run our metro bus service. He's now fixated on infrastructure as the leader of our Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce. He is former Wyandotte County Mayor Joe Reardon. Quinton Lucas is one of 13 members of our Kansas City, Missouri City Council and one of the elite five who serves on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, which is at the heart of our conversation this hour. And Patrick Tui is with the Show Me Institute, who has raised questions about the direction and focus of our region's quest to fix and enhance our infrastructure. Please give them a big hand, ladies and gentlemen. Now, we've been told infrastructure is a terribly boring to topic. Nobody's interested in it. We're only interested in infrastructure when a major crisis hits. A bridge collapses, there's a major contamination of the water supply. Then people somehow get fixated. Yet we're launching this program today right after a major election in Kansas City where voters pass three questions all about the nitty-gritty details of infrastructure, not only supporting them, Troy Schulte, but in overwhelming numbers, and I'm willing to actually almost hand over their wallets to support them. So why, what does that tell us about people's views on infrastructure in this community? Uh, I think people get it. I think they understand the issue. They drive on it every day. They see the potholes. They see the deteriorating sidewalks. And I think uh, voters uh, accepted the fact that it, uh, living in a great city comes at a cost. And there's only 470,000 of us right now taking up 318 square miles. So our cost per person is going to be much higher than it would be a, a Philadelphia or a San Francisco or even a New York, which all can fit within our geographic borders. On the day of the election, there were reporters in this community who tweeted out photographs of empty polling stations uh, on election day. And yet, Quinton Lucas, on the very day of the election, we see a turnout in that election that was actually twice the number of people who voted for the mayor this past time around. We've been hearing for decades people talk about Kansas City's infrastructure concerns, complaints about uh, metal plates, potholes, et cetera, and, and bad sidewalks. And so I think we were able to say kind of clearly, what is it that we want to fix? What will we fix? And then I think the people listened. Now, the city already spends, Patrick Toohey, millions and millions of dollars on infrastructure. They've just got $800 million more. What is stopping the city, though, from just taking the money they were spending on infrastructure and spending it now on other projects? Uh, nothing. In fact, that's uh, most likely exactly what the city will do. Uh, the city right now has general fund commitments that it spends on infrastructure. It will take now the, the increase in taxes, put it towards those projects, but then reduce its own general fund obligation. So how do we know that's not going to happen, Troy Schulte? Well, I, he's wrong, uh, flat out. 76% um, of the general fund is about $550 million. 76% of every dollar in the general fund uh, goes to public safety, police and fire. So that's where the overwhelming issue is. All of our infrastructure uh, dollars before 
uh, this uh, bond issue was uh, street maintenance, which is restricted by a voter approval. When you approve the 2012 park sales tax, you said 7.5% of the earnings tax will be committed to infrastructure. That's in there. The rest of it is uh, street uh, uh, motor fuel tax money, which is restricted by state law to only street purposes, and the capital improvements fund, which again is restricted by voter approval only on basic infrastructure. So the thing that's in the general fund that everybody's worried about is people, and that's mostly police and fire. So there isn't going to be a lot of shifting because there's nothing left to shift. Quentin Lucas has said in presentations, the one I attended in Waldo, that the great thing about this go bond vote is that it will free up money that the city can put to other causes. Uh, what does that mean if it doesn't mean that the city is going to reduce its general fund spending on these infrastructure projects and, and spend it elsewhere? So what does it mean, Councilman Lucas? Well, Quentin Lucas is a fool uh, in so many words. No, I, I think what we're uh, discussing and addressing after some questioning at the very function he was talking about was that there are a lot of people that say, all right, you're doing this infrastructure bond. Do you still care about housing? Do you care about actually having jobs and employees, increasing pay wages for people who work for the Parks Department, et cetera? And so the answer at the time was actually that we will continue to focus on those efforts as well. Regardless of pesky questions about the ins and outs of those questions on the ballot on infrastructure, voters again overwhelmingly said, yeah, we want to part with our money to do this. So why is it then, Brian, that people in Kansas City made those connections on things like sidewalks and flood control, yet don't make those connections about funding when it comes to things like highways, which are we're also seeing, and bridges that are also crumbling. We've wondered the same thing. We put a lot of effort into trying to identify what the public wants, um, stretch the dollars, let them know if you want more, it's going to cost more, uh, and try and package that in some way that, that is appealing to, to the typical voter. We have not been successful in doing that. I, you know, Missouri's a big state. We have over 34,000 miles of roads. Um, I think most folks drive on one or 200 miles of those, and those are the ones they want fixed. I think it's hard for folks to vote yes when they're not going to get the benefit of the statewide system on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, you're uh, with the Missouri Department of Transportation. In Kansas, we see billboards like this one uh, featuring a masked man and the caption, Highway robbery, the sign claims a million dollars a day is being diverted from Kansas highways to help balance the state's budget. That would be $2.7 billion in funding since 2011. Is that just the frustration of the Kansas Contractors Association who are missing out on that business? Absolutely not. It's the frustration of every business in Kansas City, which relies on that highway system to move goods and people. Um, we believe there was a promise made in the commitments of those dollars over time to infrastructure improvement around the highways, and not making those investments harms Kansas City, harms business in Kansas City as well. So we talk about Kansas, but Brian, in the state of Missouri, um, only three states spend less than Missouri on their highways. Has it always been that way? I think typically Missouri is a... Uh would like to pay as least taxes as possible. It's a low tax, low, low benefit expectation, really, compared to the East or West Coast. Why is it so difficult for people then to make the connections, do you think, Patrick? I haven't seen any research that suggests this, but my guess would be that people are closer to the problem in Kansas City. Uh, Troy's right, they drive over the roads, they see the metal plates, the crumbling sidewalks, they understand it, a statewide sales tax that we had a, a few years ago in Missouri, uh, people are probably afraid that their money is going to go to some far-flung corner of the state that they'll never visit. There was less uh, local buy-in. And another problem, by the way, is uh, Missouri has a very low fuel tax. It's 17 cents uh, a gallon. And uh, I think it's uh, completely reasonable for the state to want to increase that gas tax to pay for increasing amount of need uh, statewide. But the legislature uh, thinks it's a poison pill and hasn't wanted to touch it. Only four states. Um, charge less than the state of Missouri at 17 cents, one of the lowest in the nation. Kansas, by the way, is at 24 cents. So why not just increase the gas tax then? What's the challenge of doing that in the state of Missouri, Brian? The Hancock Amendment limits the uh, ability of the legislature just to raise taxes beyond, I think, 90 or $94 million um, is the total max. And most of them didn't run for office based on, I'm going to raise your taxes. Are more fuel-efficient vehicles, electric, hybrid vehicles, though, part of the problem because they are not paying the gas tax? 
I think as the evolution of the automobile continues forward and that becomes a larger, larger piece, uh, right now folks are buying more, more fuel than they have in the past. They're driving more, uh, they're buying new cars. Um, so the electric vehicles really haven't put that big a dent in our revenue streams yet. They will over time. You know, a number of states have actually now charging a special fee for people who drive electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles. Um, the legislature in Maine currently weighing a $250 annual registration fee on hybrid vehicles, $350 fee on all electric vehicles. California and Minnesota considering similar bills. What about Missouri? Again, that would be up to the elected officials to make those decisions. Um, at the end of the day, it's going to cost X dollars to operate and maintain the infrastructure. Whether that's all goes to heavy trucks who do the most damage, um, but then your food bill is going to go up, your, everything you buy at the store that came on a truck, every, the consumer, the, the general population is going to pay for it one way or another. So whether it's a $300 surcharge on an electric vehicle really doesn't answer the total infrastructure funding question. There's also been the argument about putting toll roads, of course, in the state of Missouri. The state of Kansas has had toll roads uh, since the 1950s. Kansas has also been an overwhelmingly Republican state. Why this complete reluctance to have tolls in the state of Missouri, Patrick? Uh, well, that's an excellent question. Uh, I don't understand it, but it is out there. Uh, the great thing about toll roads is it, it acts as a user fee. It charges the people who do the most damage, who use the roads the most. And, and I think that's the most appropriate way to, to collect taxes and fees is, is go to the people who use those amenities rather than, I think what MoDOT suggested a few years ago, a sales tax which would be regressive, would, would hit everybody regardless of how much they use the roads. 31% of all of Missouri's roads are in poor or mediocre condition. 14% of the state's bridges are structurally deficient. KCPT went out with a MoDOT engineer to check out the latest bridge of concern, the Broadway Bridge, recently named the Buck O'Neill Bridge. This main connector between downtown and North Kansas City is the latest poster child for the region's crumbling infrastructure. MoDOT recently alarming city officials in calling for the bridge to be closed, not just for a month or two, but for two years so massive repairs can be made. Let me get you a vest. Okay, cool. We're going to walk up to the main span, to the main truss spans. And you can see here where the armors just gave, the armors just gave up. There's a good gap right here. Let's go across. So the three open great areas, the water's just dumping over onto those stringers. All the expansion joints on this bridge are deteriorated to the point where they're done with their useful life. These cars are just coming. We feel that this bridge needs to be rehabbed within the next three years. If there is a problem, we will close the bridge, and we have shown that. We have done that in the past. Do we want to know, and we'll do what we can to keep them open and to make sure they're safe? But like I said, the number one thing is safety of the traveling public. Is the public in danger? No, not at all. They're, they're at risk for an unexpected closure potentially down the road. Now, there's lots of headlines about this, and oh, it's imminent need to be replaced, Troy Schulte, but for the funding for doing that, was that part of the infrastructure bond election? No, because it is the, the Broadway Bridge or the Buck O'Neill Bridge is a state asset. It's owned by the state of Missouri. It's not a city asset. So our bond program was designed to deal with the city-owned infrastructure. We have 550 of our own structures. We have 40,000 cars a day past that road. It has a tremendous impact on our overall economic uh, development uh, capacity. If people can't get north-south, I've got thousands of people who live north and work south and vice versa, if they have trouble getting north and south, that's going to affect our overall economic vitality of, of Kansas City, Missouri, but also the region as a whole. So even though it's his bridge and it's the state's bridge, we're all in this to try to figure out a solution that makes sense because we're all impacted by a two-year closure. It's that infrastructure that's not just a city issue. It's a, it's a regional asset. But, but it wouldn't take it? any city money involved in this because you're saying this is a we'd, we'd like to avoid bridge. Uh, we'd like to avoid a way to uh, not put city dollars into it but that's one of the issues that when when the city council and myself uh, were out talking to residents over the last six months we talked about the need for flexibility we had hoped that we wouldn't have to deal with flexibility on day two 
But those are the types of issues that we've got to have flexibility as critical needs arise. Is there a best way to do a partnership with the public sector or the private sector to deal with a critical piece of infrastructure for this region? But we know that President Trump has proposed a $1 trillion infrastructure package, part of his new program of national rebuilding. Now, couldn't the Trump administration then help with something like the Broadway Bridge, which is a bigger project, or the highways that we talked about, whether they be interstate highways in Kansas, I-70 from Kansas City to St. Louis in Missouri? I don't think there's any clarity yet as to what that infrastructure um, plan looks like um, from the Trump administration, um, and it has, hasn't yet emerged. Councilman Lucas and City Manager Schulte, on an ongoing basis, do you have engagement conversations with the Trump administration over issues like this, or th there's no conversation that takes place? You know, I, in terms of conversations with the Trump administration, I, I think the way we try to reach out is through our elected officials in Washington. Uh, we have folks that are reaching out to our Congress people, our senators every day, including the Kansas delegation as well. I haven't touched water bills. I haven't touched the future of transit and streetcar expansion. We're going to get to all of those. Plus, we've got some great questions, which I'm going to get to in just a moment. But just one other question. Um, could we be traveling by Hyperloop soon between Kansas City and St. Louis. Did you see those headlines, ladies and gentlemen? Come on. You can travel in electric pods in as little as 23 minutes between St. Louis and Kansas City, all funded by billionaire inventor Elon Musk, CEO of Tesla and the aerospace firm SpaceX. The MoDOT, Missouri Department of Transportation team, has been shortlisted as part of a global challenge to bring the Hyperloop to Missouri. How seriously are we supposed to take this, Brian? I guess we'll wait and see what's coming. We, we're, <laughs> we're excited to be shortlisted. We're one of 11, I believe, out of 2,600, I think, applications. Nick, I would say, I mean, if you think about this, it is, you know, you can chuckle about it. But if you look at what's happened in transportation in just a short amount of time, how many people in this room or watching this program now use things like Uber or Lyft, things that were unheard of five years ago, the idea that you can have self-driving vehicles, which would have been laughed at even five years ago as well, now becoming reality. The, the good thing is Kansas City can compete for these things. We absolutely are the kind of place that can be competitive for this kind of innovation in transportation. And we can prove out in, in the size of our city how different modes work together. So I think these are exciting things. Some of them won't land here. Others might be pie in the sky. But to play in that space is important for this region. I want to hear from you. Your question first, sir. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having us. Um, as is the first question in all the neighborhood meetings that I've been attending is the water bill. Uh, about two weeks ago on uh, KCPT, there was a special program talking about the pollution of the Blue River. I've lived in the, Blue, the vicinity of the Blue River all my life, still do. I watched it get more and more polluted every year to where it is now. And the conclusion that was reached by that program is that the water bills are accelerating and poor people are being taxed at the level that they are because of pollution coming from Johnson County in Kansas polluting the Blue River. And the city's accelerated costs in trying to keep that waterway in some way clean. And I thought it was a pretty good conclusion I wonder why the city isn't suing the state of Kansas or Johnson County to keep these water bills from bankrupting people. Okay. Let me, let me, before you answer, okay, because this, this is a great question. We have a clip of that documentary for those who didn't see it. It's a short clip, so you can get a sense of what this gentleman has said, and we'll get our, our, our panelists to respond. Is that okay with everyone? Yes. Okay. For many people in Kansas City, the water bill has become unaffordable. I go over here and pay my gas, so we're gas but I don't have enough money for the water. Prices have rocketed, and they're set to rise even more. If the water rates increase this month, they don't have the money to pay for it. Don't pay your bill, and they'll cut you off. The numbers are staggering. I can't cook, I can't clean, I can't groom, me and my kids. We're paying to keep sewage out of our rivers, but are they getting any cleaner? The Blue River is brown, and you wouldn't let your dog drink from here. We ask whether parts of our community 
are shouldering too much of the burden. First of all, I don't think that the public can continue to support the full weight. As far as the rates going up, we have to still be fair. And we ask whether our local leaders can find the right answers. And I think we have said this is going too high, too fast. Since the year 2000, the average water bill in Kansas City, Missouri, has risen by over 240 percent. Nonprofits have had to step into the breach to help those who can't keep up. Our clients' water bills are not 50 and 75 and 100 dollars, but their water bills are now 200 dollars. They don't have the money to pay for it. If your bill is over 150 dollars and 56 days past due, you could be cut off. Don't let the water run too long, okay? It was in 2008 that KC Water, which services around 150,000 households, decided to start enforcing its cut-off policy. Since then, it's cut off nearly 140,000 accounts. Last year, it cut off over 21,000. In Johnson County, Water One, with nearly the same number of accounts, cut off just over 1,500. Kansas City, Kansas, claims it doesn't keep a record of cutoffs. So there's an excerpt from that documentary. It sets the scene. That gentleman asked the question. The documentary claimed the low-income residents are paying the biggest burden for those water and sewer upgrades. What is the city doing to address that concern? We've been dealing with a uh, living under a consent decree since um, St. Patrick's Day 2010. We're in seven years of a 25-year uh, go federal government mandate uh, by the Environmental Protection Agency to overhaul our sewer system. Uh, we dumped 6.4 billion gallons of sewage, raw sewage, into the uh, Missouri River on an annual basis. Uh, we have a mandate by 2035 to reduce that number to 1.4 billion. Um, that's a that's a four and a half to five billion dollar price tag. It is one of those situations we're wrestling with. The city council has tasked me and a uh, steady group that's been working for nearly a year to try to basically go back to the Environmental Protection Agency and renegotiate our contract, uh, our consent decree. Either give us more time because we've got an affordability issue or cut out some of these requirements. So uh, we're going to try, but again, it's the federal government saying thou shalt fix it up. It's an unfunded federal mandate, and they came after Kansas City, Missouri. To do is, is that the only way that the city will see a reduction in water bills if you get a relaxation of those federal uh, my, That's my sense, is we're going to have to have some assistance from the federal government um, to, to make that happen, either more time or, or a, a, a relaxation of the requirements. Um, those are, those are the issues that we've got to deal with, but we've also got to deal with the fact that our infrastructure uh, is old. Uh, and the, I always tell people the days of cheap water are over. It's a question of how do you want to pay to fix that infrastructure up. A couple years ago, we, had 1800, we ran a couple years of 1,800 water main breaks in an annual, on a, within 12 months. We've cut that to less than 800 on an annual basis. Still too many, but at, that came at an expense. We've got sewers that date to the Civil War, water lines that date to the 1870s. With the streetcar project, we just took a wooden water line out at the river market. So that tells you how old our infrastructure is. So we've gotten the value out of it, but the replacement comes at an expense. Quentin Lucas, um, as a councilman, when in the basket of all of the issues you have to deal with, and people are calling you at your home or at your office, where does water bills come in there? It, it's probably first or second. So people talk about violent crime and they talk about their water bills. That's largely what I hear, and actually more parts of the city than you would think. And so we're mindful of what the gentleman was saying, in essence, that we need to do something, and that we can't just wait as we see utility costs increase, not just with water, but other utilities. And there's a tax burden that's significant here, so that's why I think we're trying to come up with some holistic answers so that a generation from now, the problem isn't just worse. I know there's a lot of other questions, but there was another important component to that gentleman's question, which is why isn't Kansas City then suing communities on the Kansas side because a lot of the water in the Blue River is being polluted from the Kansas side of the state line? I'm not sure that's the best approach to build regional cooperation. Um, <laughs> you, you get more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. Uh, but I think that's the issue we got to deal with is how do we, how do we collectively, and, and we've actually, through the Mid-America Regional Council, 
Johnson County and Kansas City are actually undergoing an integrated planning process for that Blue River watershed. Those conversations weren't taking place seven, ten years ago. They are now, and I think it's we've got to be able to take that back to the EPA and say, give us a chance to do something different. You were one of those Kansas side mayors yes. who might have been uh, impacted uh, Nick, by Nick, that. Nick, I'm, I'm not proud to say that uh, before I left office, we had to enter into a consent decree with the um, federal government and the EPA um, under the Clean Water Act. And uh, what's extremely harmful about this is, is that the EPA in, in the Clean Water Act should be considering affordability as part of the, the mandate um, in the consent decree. And quite frankly, I don't believe that they accurately do that in communities that are of limited means. And the effect is, is that it takes away all the local control. So for an elected official like Councilman Lucas or the entire governing body, they receive legitimate complaints about these, raised, these rates that are being raised, and it really is a federal mandate that takes away local control and offers no solution, quite frankly, and no cooperation from the federal government. It's a huge disconnect across this country. It, it happened in KCK as well, and, and the same scenario is playing itself out in other places. More of your questions in just a moment, but I, I want to bring in the, the issue of transit. We haven't talked about that yet. Huge area. Streetcar expansion. Kansas City now getting ready to begin a mail-in ballot election for the expansion of the downtown streetcar, so it extends from Union Station down to the plaza and on to UMKC. Why a mail-in election, Troy Schulte, for such an important issue as that? What we are doing is expanding a transportation development district a mail-in ballot is actually allowable by state code, uh, state law, as a viable election alternative for that relatively confined district. It's not a citywide transportation development. It's geographically limited. So it was one of those issues of how do we, how's the best way to reach those folks? Patrick. Well, the reason why they don't have a citywide vote on streetcar is because it's defeated uh, every time, with the exception of Clay Chastain's uh, single effort. So what, what? What streetcar uh, supporters have done is basically tried to politically gerrymander districts that they're confident will win. It hasn't worked every time, but they're at a 50% win ratio now, so they're looking to gerrymander the, the southern extension. Now, the project is expected to cost around $227 million. If the idea is to better connect the city, are there better ways of spending $227 million? What if we spent that money, and Joe Ridden, you were running the bus service, what if we were to inject $227 million on bus services or other transit in this community? What would that look like? Well, all transit needs more, um, needs more revenue or in, in more uh, contribution in Kansas City, and I think there's huge opportunities. But I certainly don't think it's pitting one mode against another. Um, I think it's looking at what mode makes the most sense in what part of the city and then deploying that in a way that has a system in mind. So I think for all of us in this room, certainly for the business community, um, developing a region-wide system that connects people to jobs only 10% of jobs are connected by transit effectively today in Kansas City. Ought to be the overreaching goal. In some places, that might be fixed rail. In other places, it may be bus. In other places, it might be one of these new innovations that we've talked about as well. Patrick. Let me add in. Actually, no, it does pit one form of transit over the other. It takes away from what cities are able to spend on bus transit, which actually gets people to jobs and home and serves thousands more uh, people than, than kind of one rail line, whether it's two miles or four miles. Uh, Troy Schulte, in a KCPT segment, you also said that, you know, getting people to jobs was a problem. Does streetcar expansion, though, solve that issue? Uh, not initially, but I think it will as the system expands over time. Uh, getting to the Country Club Plaza connects now your two, your three major population areas. Your job, uh, we got tremendous job uh, capacity in the Country Club Plaza area through our Midtown area and our Downtown area. And then as you build out on that system, remember that's a streetcar system that because it operates as a streetcar system. Those are light rail vehicles. Those vehicles can go 45 mile an hour. They could accelerate. We just happen to use them to stop every couple of blocks under a streetcar system, very common in other cities. But as we move out in the metropolitan area in all directions, those same cars, which now are operating a streetcar, can become light rail and a connecting issue for these widely dispersed job centers. Joe Reden, why is this always a Kansas City, Missouri conversation? Why aren't we hearing about streetcar expansion to the legends in KCK or to Oak Park Mall in uh, Overland Park? 
Well, I think you're starting to hear a conversation in the region about transit. I think that there's a growing interest across Kansas City, whether it's in suburban parts or in the more urban areas, about understanding that it's not just going to be highways that connect this region together. Patrick Tui, you either have indigestion or you want to say something. 40% of our airport's revenue comes from parking. We will never have a streetcar to the airport. They, they, they won't support it. it. It may be something that drives people's interest, but it is the absolute most expensive application of streetcar, and the airport would never want a streetcar going out there. Sean in Olathe asks, why doesn't someone build a park and ride in Johnson County where you can catch um, the bus that takes you directly to KCI Airport? I think a lot of people would love that service, he says. <laughs> What's the challenge, Joe Reardon, of implementing an idea like that? Well, number one, you don't need street good, good question. Just my point is that kind of interest exists out in Olathe. And so I think it's a matter of the KCATA and now a new partnership that it's formed with Johnson County and their transit operation to think about offering that opportunity. And I think you've seen other cities do it very effectively. Prior to um, Denver building rail all the way out um, to their airport, they had a great robust coach system that brought people from park and rides throughout the region out to the Denver airport. That opportunity exists in Kansas City for sure. I'll just make a very quick point on streetcar, which is there's one point we're missing when we're talking about can the streetcar get somebody to work. If it isn't doing enough of that now, the thing that we're trying to build with the streetcar line is actually jobs along the streetcar line. And that is where we have access, east-west bus service, et cetera. So if we can actually have a job center downtown, economic development downtown, and Midtown if expanded, that actually builds the economic development base that supports our bus system. That is fundamentally multimodal transit and what we're trying to accomplish. So it's not always as simple as a question of can you take a streetcar from Olathe to the airport. No one's purporting to have that answer yet. What we're trying to do is build a city that has a job base that's attracting population, and that's largely what our streetcar conversation is. Madam, you've been so patient, you deserve a KCPT mug, and I need to get you one of those, because well, you've been my, so nice. You're my Friday night 7.30 talk. Oh, you are so fabulous. Thank you, miss. And your question. Okay, mine is about my property tax and everybody else's. Is there a schedule of what, how you're going to raise them every year, or is it going to be a big surprise? <laughs> uh, the plan is that, uh, as we discussed in the campaign, uh, for the average home in Kansas City, the average selling price of a home in Kansas City, which at the is end of, what? At which is what? One hundred and forty thousand dollars is the average selling price of a home in Kansas City. At the end of twenty years, your property tax will be one hundred and sixty dollars more per year, and so. It, the plan is that we will level that will increase over time. We were using about an eight dollar a year average increase over time, eight, sixteen, twenty four, thirty two for the next twenty years as we issue those bonds in forty million dollar increments. So, if you want to do the calculation, take your total property tax bill and multiply it by one point zero zero three percent, three tenths of one percent and that'll tell you how much your taxes will increase on an annual basis. So until 20 years, I won't have the total. Right, it'll work, it'll work up gradually. So even though voters <coughs> authorized 800 million in bonds, we will only sell them 40 million a year for the next 20 years. So what we wanted to try to do is figure out a way to finance it over a long period of time and make it relatively more affordable for our residents. And you're totally committed to that? Absolutely. Okay, I'll Are you hold satisfied? you to, well, I'm happier. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thanks for your That's one. We need you on every show. Uh, yes, sir, your question. Uh, I was curious about your opinions and thoughts on the potential for privatization of infrastructure. We see it in other cities with uh, privately owned bridges and roadways, and it's anticipated that a lot of the federal investing will actually be subsidies in privately owned entities to build their own infrastructure and then reap the benefits from tolls and other things on those roadways. I was curious what your thoughts are. Excellent. Brian, did you have a comment on that? If that's what the public wants and that's what the elected officials want to put on the ballot and put out to a vote, it does take a vote of the people. Um, it does going to be generating tolls. Um, and so far, that has not been well received by the legislature or the public. 
when it comes to the city, there was a time, I remember under Kay Barnes when she was mayor, there was talk about privatizing the water department. What you would have to build into the water department, or if you were to do that type of an issue, or you look at KCI or some of these other issues, is the cost of capital. That private money comes at a much higher cost than public financed uh, projects. So uh, if you want to go out and get your money at 7 or 7% 7 interest versus 3% interest, which is what the city can borrow its money at, uh, you're going to pay a premium, and that's going to translate into rates. So there is a cost associated with public-private partnerships. There can be some tremendous benefits, access to capital, all those issues that aren't available. But for every action, there's an opposite reaction. It's a question of how much do people want to pay to achieve that benefit. Joe Ridden. The chamber took a trip to uh, Dallas-Fort Worth in the fall, and we saw a new kind of model in public-private partnership around um, highways. And the LBJ Highway, I believe, entered into an agreement with a private partner where the partner actually improved the highway, added two lanes. Those are demand toll lanes, so when the highway's crowded, you can pay money to go in those lanes. You don't have to. Um, but as part of that, agreed to maintain the, the infrastructure for a period of 20 years. It still remains an asset of the government, but this sort of in, in, this new way of thinking about paying for the asset over time and offering that, I thought was a very innovative way of approaching a public-private partnership um, short of selling off the asset altogether. Do you have to have three mannequins in the car with you to make it look like it's a high <laughs> occupancy vehicle? No, you just have to pay the fare that they say if you get into the okay. lane. That's the bottom uh, Patrick line. Patrick Tui, I would assume, I, I might be completely wrong, but I would have assumed you might like the idea of private no, very... or is there a downside to it? Oh, uh, not for the public, I don't think there is a downside. Uh, they, other states around the country have had incredible uh, experiences with this. I, I believe it was Indiana that privatized a, a section of its road, sold it to a private business, maintained the asset. When the uh, business went under because it couldn't make it work, the road reverted with repairs back to the public. So it was a win-win opportunity for the public. It absolutely is something that, uh, that Missouri uh, should explore. Your question, sir. Uh, I'm just curious as to the size and scope of this project and, and how it relates to what some other peer cities are looking into or have done in the past. It's the largest bond program in the city's history. Other cities across the country are dealing with these types of infrastructure issues. We're not alone in dealing with an $800 million uh, issue. Other cities are tackling 500 million, 1 billion issues. So any city that has infrastructure as old as ours, and we're young by some, as you move northeast in this city, in this country, they're having the same conversations and have been having the same conversations for decades. What is the estimate of jobs that will be created within the next five years with our infrastructure expenditures? Well, there's an, an analysis that for every million dollars that you spend on infrastructure, you create, permit, you create 19 permanent jobs. We sold it as an investment, but that's one of those um, benefits that'll come out of it. What we have uh, worked with on the city council is to make sure how do we provide with this infrastructure investment opportunities for people that right now aren't participating in the workforce. Is there an opportunity for them to learn a skill uh, is there a way to do sidewalks differently that that provides a hand up for folks to say, I don't have, I'm functionally long-term unemployed, but if I get a functional skill, I can then get on a union crew and do other concrete flat work around the city. So we want to take that 19 number and see if we can magnify it and really ex extend the benefits to not only the city in, in terms of new and improved infrastructure, but a whole lot of wealth creation within the city. So that sounds like a hope, not a plan. It's all hope. It is, it is all hope. Uh, uh, God bless Kansas City voters, but they are hoping that the next 40 years will be different than the last 40 years. The reason why we have the problem of infrastructure is because previous councils neglected their basic duties. So we are hoping that future councils, which by the way are bound by none of this, uh, will act responsibly, but it is hope. So can I, can I just say legally, and I wasn't hired by the city to do anything, but, but this isn't all just speculative, right? The voters, the reason we had the three ballot questions, and we had a long council debate about it too, in some ways that I didn't want the three separate ballot questions. By law, we were required to do what we said we would do. Six, so right, this $600 million amount will go to roads, bridges, and sidewalks. Full stop. If for some reason we deferred it and spent it on gondolas or anything else, then I'm sure a very good group like Mr. Tui's or someone else's can sue the city and try to enjoin us from that type of action. Right? These are legal requirements that a council in 10 years, a council in 15 years cannot abrogate. So that amount of money will go there. 
Can I promise what a council will do with some different amount of money 40 years from now? I don't. I can't. But we can promise that in connection with this bond obligation that the voters voted on, that is explicit in the language and it has to be required to be spent that way. Are you satisfied, Miss? Yes. Okay. Can I ask you another question? Very quickly, then. Go ahead. All right. My other question is about making a political argument for user pay, specifically for the Broadway Buck O'Neill Bridge. If 40,000 cars go through there a day, and I'm not questioning your numbers, and we were to charge a dollar a car, or even 50 cents per car on a daily basis, you know, we'd have $40 million in 100 days, if my math is good. In a year, we'd have 120 million. Why can't we make that case and get that bridge repaired? Brian Kidwell. Uh, in Missouri, it's back to a vote of the people. If Casey Moe um, took the bridge back over, They'd be free to uh, to start up a program like that. We we cannot do it without a vote. Isn't it the case historically though that bridge has been there 60 years? It was a toll bridge at one time. Wow. Fairfax was a toll bridge. Uh, the old Paseo toll. Our entire infrastructure system was built by our parents and grandparents. A lot of it was by tolls. A lot of it was by just a, a higher commitment financially out of each individual. Um, that's over. For my generation and certainly younger, um, just use it. We expect it to be free of defects, um, free of congestion, um, and nobody's really very interested in paying what it takes to, to go forward. But we are interested in what you have to say, madam. Thank you for being here. Hi. I have to say I do remember stopping and paying those tolls. And then I have a real quick question for Modot Man. Um, on <laughs> it seems to me that in April, you all say, hey, let's get every cone we have out. Because there are cones set up way before any kind of construction is taking place or work is taking place. Am I wrong about that? Uh, April does bring out the cones. We've, we've, <laughs> we've been... And I don't care if there were men that, or people there working, but it's like they are just set up there for weeks before anything really takes place. No, and you're absolutely right. The public cannot stand a un, unoccupied work zone. It drives them nuts, and it should. Um, April does start the construction season. You ease into it. You have to. You have to start moving some barrier. That may just take a couple of guys. You have to take the whole lane just to have a couple of guys moving the concrete barrier out there before the the 20 guys can come out with jackhammers and really get visible. So, they should not be out there. We should not be interrupting traffic flow um, without a good reason. Sometimes there's not a lot of people, but but there will be. They're coming. I know they're coming. I want them there when they're. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay, thank you very much. If it helps, uh, Nick stole four barriers, apparently, for the donor. Was other members of KCPT? I don't know where they got them from, ladies and gentlemen. I was not involved in any criminal offences. Still to come, more of your questions, plus an update on how debate over a new single terminal at KCI impacts the infrastructure conversation. But first, climb on board as we follow three Kansas City residents as they try to navigate our bus system. Michael Price brings us a slice of bus life. That happens all. <laughs> What's it like to use public transport in Kansas City? We go on a journey with three people who know the system inside and out. There's Kevin, Sheila, and John. You're just all on the same journey. You're part of the same city. I thought he was, but he was just coming. It's a little down. after eight o'clock on a freezing cold morning in February. It's very important to me to have independence as a person who's blind, and since I don't drive, I need to be where the transportation is, the public transportation. With a busy day of work ahead, Sheila can't afford to miss the bus, and she can't afford for it to miss her. Excellent. Yeah. Does that happen often? It doesn't happen often, but I'm going to freeze to death, and we're, you know. When's the next bus now? It's 20 whole minutes. Fortunately for Sheila, a passenger on the bus no, told the driver he'd missed her. I mean, we were both standing there. Why didn't it stop? I think he's gone round, Sheila. He's just... You think somebody yelled at him? Sheila lives and works within a bus corridor. If you can do that, the system, by and large, is reliable and regular. Yeah, it's okay. 
Like I don't actually need to have a car where I live, with what kind of work I do, where I do it. For John, it's not just about saving money. It's also about community. The beautiful thing about the buses is you have an opportunity to encounter people without the windshield and are just like you in so many different ways. Well, I'm checking the times. It's 10.55 and the next streetcar is at 11.02. John's studio is in the crossroads and the addition of the short streetcar line hasn't given him a new route. He could have taken a bus, but he does appreciate what it's doing for the image of public transport. In a subversive way, people are beginning to know what public transit can be for this city. It's really nice, it's consistent. This may be what the future looks like, but right now, in John's experience, there are inconsistencies in the city's public transit system. I have a fantastic experience of public transit between downtown and 75th Street, between Broadway and Prospect. Outside of that corridor, however, it would be a struggle at best. And like John, Sheila has also found the system to be patchy. Did we have pretty good bus service downtown and midtown? But I can't go over to Kansas very easily, or I can't attend things north of the river very easily or go south. So what's it like to be reliant on public transport outside of its corridors? Right now it is about 614. When I first started taking this trip, it was very draining. And then my body got used to it. Kevin lives near to 72nd Street in the Northland. And in the spring of 2015, he enrolled at Johnson County Community College. This is the next stage of the journey. I'm at the Antioch Park and Drive. While Kevin saves up for a car, he's had to rely on the bus service to get to college. By car, the round trip would take about an hour. By bus, it's closer to five hours. And for Kevin, it wasn't just the length of the journey that was off-putting at first. So I conquered a fear of people that can be a bit scary, especially downtown that take the bus and some of them stay on the bus. It's a slice of real life and it is something that you do see on the bus. During Sheila's short bus journey into work on this particular morning, a man gets on who starts talking to himself. Look at that, baby. There are people who talk to themselves on the bus, and the bus is a, sometimes, I think, a, a safe haven. They're very nice people, and I don't feel at all unsafe. So would you become a bus rider? It's not always convenient, and its coverage is patchy. But perhaps if more of us took it, or could take it, we'd be helping to build, in some small way, a better community. You're just all in the same journey. Community is not just who you know intimately, it's also social, it's also public. Madam, we're ready for your question. Uh, I, I want to go back to the streetcar for a minute. First of all, I feel like the streetcar was really crammed down our throats for the people who go downtown and the small business. I've been going to City Market for years. Now you can't get down there on the weekend because the streetcars took up all the parking. Now I live in this neighborhood and they're gonna end the streetcar right in my neighborhood where people who come to ride it are gonna be parking all over our neighborhood because there's no parking. The UMKC students already do it. If you're gonna do the streetcar, Where's the parking? All of the research from around the country, certainly uh, maybe around the world, that demonstrates that streetcars do not take cars off the road at all. Uh, probably what's happening in the River Market is, is the streetcar right now is an oddity. It's, it's, a, it's a theme park ride. It's a party bus. So people drive to it, ride it around, get back in their car and go home. It's not functional transit. Don't we have, speaking of the River Market, uh, Troy Shorty, uh, the problem of where city employees, not city employees, but any employees downtown who are parking in expensive parking spaces are saying, hey, I don't even need to have a parking permit anymore. I can park in the river market, take the streetcar, and I don't have to pay a dime. What you see now is, and you're seeing it in the crossroads, is we actually have now a limited parking. So it used to have unlimited parking on the streets in the river market and crossroads. You now have two to three hour limits. That's the first step towards probably paid parking on the streets. It's a radical idea. Every other city in the country's dealt with it. We're gonna have to deal with it. I can tell you 10 years ago, before we made the investments in downtown, you could come downtown and park anywhere you wanted all day long, because there was nobody downtown. I'd personally have this problem than the other the alternative. 
in, in my house, we are going to be paying for the streetcar, and it's a residential neighborhood, and there is no parking. Well, Nick, let me just say this to the lady. There, there is hope. So unlike some of us who don't live in this part of Kansas City, you will get a vote on this. And so it's not a done it's deal. It's a secret uh, vote but, that you well, have to... But fair enough, you have one. And so what I would encourage you and your neighbors, no matter how you feel about it, to go out and vote in connection with that. And your vote doesn't actually, and your voice doesn't stop there. In terms of parking, every week at City Council, we talk more about parking than I ever thought the job was about. In every single neighborhood, people talk about parking and what they want. We have kind of a cultural question for Kansas City now, and there are different sides. Some say, I want to be able to get somewhere, park efficiently, spend money, and that's my view. Others say, we want to get people to park a block away, 10 blocks away, walk around and spend. And so this is not a fait accompli. Instead, what it is is an ongoing conversation that we'll have in this city. And so I'd encourage you to express your right to vote and to make sure everybody else does. Thank you very much, madam. I'm going to get to your question in a moment, sir, as we're staying on the streetcar issue, because streetcar officials are counting on up to $100 million in federal funding for construction costs. The president has proposed eliminating the Tiger Grant program that funded substantially the original uh, starter streetcar line. So does this imperil the financing of the expansion project, Troy Schulte? Not necessarily, because what we, uh, what we are anticipating for uh, the streetcar extension to the Country Club Plaza in UMKC is a program called Small Starts or New Starts. That program continues. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get a Tiger Grant for the first streetcar expansion, the uh, first streetcar project between the River Market and Crown Center. What we are now doing with the expansion is requesting that we, be, we participate in federally financed funds that are available for transit. Those programs are continuing. Uh, there's some debate over what level they're going to continue, but unlike the Tiger program that was recommended in the tr Trump administration budget, uh, those programs continue. It's just a matter of getting in line for those funds and then seeing how much funds there are on a national basis to deal with it. My understanding is that the smart, uh, small start program uh, has been frozen. If you are not already in line, uh, the chances of you getting, you'll be turned down outright. I understand the prospect max is in line. We made it in, but that it is, uh, it is uh, very, very sketchy that we will be eligible for $100 million for the, uh, for the streetcar. We need the $100 million to make, this, to, to make the math work from a from an issue. So if we, if we can't get in line, that will delay this, the completion of this project. Right? Is there any right. talk with an expansion of the line that it now becomes a fee to charge to, to uh, passengers as they go on the streetcar? Uh, I think the conversation has been, at least that I've been privy to, is just the opposite. How do we try to take the entire bus system in a way to encourage public transportation throughout the city and the metropolitan area? How do we, how do we take the entire system, not only the streetcar, but the buses, and make them free? Perhaps an incentive with the terminal project at KCI might be to make the airline tickets free, too. <laughs> Is that being considered? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, all right. Yes, sir, your question. Back to the streetcar issue. <laughs> Why, as an individual, should I be taxed for a city-used transportation system? I almost understand why you would tax businesses, because they have a chance of reaping some kind of financial reward. And I see the only thing that we're going to reap is congestion, slow traffic, and parking problems. I hear you. I think the answer is going to be that that you do get a chance to have a vote on this tax. So you... Why you, wasn't the vote made public? We just had an so election. We just had an you, election. Here you are. We, that election wasn't related to the streetcar, although I know there are some who think it is. Let me just answer for okay. you first, all right? So the idea is we just had an infrastructure election which relates to all these infrastructure items. There is a separate streetcar election where you and others have the chance to suggest that you don't want your tax dollars to be funding this sort of asset. And no one will uh, disrespect your right to be able to do that and to articulate that. Yes, You're not alone, yes. by the way. Let me just say, uh, Missouri State Auditor uh, Nicole Galloway just issued a report condemning uh, transportation development districts around uh, Missouri because they collect an awful lot of money and, and have very little uh, public input. But again, the reason why we're voting 
on a TDD rather than citywide is because Kansas City votes against streetcars when they're given a chance. Our host Crosby Kemper referred to uh, the first uh, uh, streetcar election as the most undemocratic since the Pendergast era. I think it was uh, 360 votes committed the city to a $100 million project. I agree with you, it is absurd, but it is the way our state laws allow for this to be done. I don't understand why this vote wasn't made more public. Has there ever been another vote where you've had to apply for a ballot to vote on an issue? The first, the first streetcar downtown. The first that one. Was, yes. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, I can see you. your pain and your concern. Okay. I want to end with this, though, ladies and gentlemen, because um, so we talked about streetcar expansion. It came so swiftly after the go bonds. Wow. And then we're told, wow, we might be even voting on the airport this year, too. Uh, are we going to be voting on the airport this year, Troy Schulte? I think there's. I think you're going to see the community conversation start, uh, whether we do, whether we vote in November or or April of 2018. Uh, the airlines have basically given us one year to figure out what our plan is. So that year is up at the end of 2017. So if we don't have a a direction. Uh, by the end of 2017, either a vote scheduled in April or having conducted a vote in November, I think the airlines start to look at alternative options. But um, Joe Ridden, it's not, it's not highways, it is not water sewers, it's not transit, but you view it very much as infrastructure of the community. <sighs> Absolutely. When we went to Dallas-Fort Worth, everywhere we went, um, the folks in Dallas said their economic development strategy rested on superior air access to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. They attributed attracting the Toyota World Headquarters to the Dallas area because they had good direct connections. And secondly, they said that every single international flight they were able to attract was the equivalent of a Super Bowl every year in economic impact leading to job creation in that city. And you're now signing on to the <laughs> KCI <laughs> single terminal plan, Patrick, <laughs> because of that. We, you know, we know what it looks like. Dallas-Fort Worth is a great example. We know what it looks like when Southwest Airlines wants to build an airport. They spent $500 million on, on, uh, in Dallas. They built the airport in Fort Lauderdale. That is not what they've offered to do in, in Kansas City. But, you know, Troy started off kind of talking about the small population in the big city of Kansas City and how that's a struggle for us. We have one of the highest property taxes in the country. We have the high, one of the highest sales taxes in the country in Kansas City, plus we have a 1% earnings tax. You will not grow Kansas City, Missouri by constantly increasing taxes. We are chasing people out of this town. But there's no taxes, though, involved in an airport. Um... Uh, the ex the, oh, absolutely not. The expense, the expense to passengers and to airlines risk that we will lose the direct flights we have but, now. But is there still a heavy lift, though, Quentin? Lucas, particularly as you said that the priority of your constituents is certainly crime, water bills? Yeah, it is absolutely right, a heavy lift. And that's why we're going to have a conversation about it. And, and don't get it wrong. I know some will think that this may just be pushed upon you. One thing the city manager didn't mention is the council has to actually agree to put it on the ballot. And, and we may not. There are different opinions on that. And so you can call your representatives and actually get them, to, heck, it worked last time, to actually have some real questions about what the future of the airport looks like. I know Patrick's smiling, but we've had a lot of things that have changed recently in Kansas City. We've had conversations on incentives. We've had conversations on infrastructure, which have actually kind of changed the course of things. And I think in the airport conversation, it's important for us to make sure that we're engaging the community and not hiding it from anyone. And I think that's what we're trying to be right now, open and transparent. And that is our public works, the cost of our aging infrastructure. Please give a big hand to our superb panel, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Public Works, the cost of our aging infrastructure is presented by Burns and McDonald and Heavy Constructors Association of Kansas City. <laughs>